Okay, good morning, folks. John O'Fru here. We're um, episode number three of the Big Conversations in a Little Caravan. And I'm joined today by the Food Systems Change Catalyst, Michael Reynolds. Michael, can you go ahead and introduce yourself, please? Good everyone. Um, as John mentioned, my name is Michael. I do lots of lots of different little things, um, but I have just recently, as of end of last year, 100% committed to um, working in a food resilience, food security um, kind of sphere. And so, what does that look like? Well. Um, I've been running, or started and running a project in Christchurch, Otatahi, um, called Roy Mata Food Commons for about two and a half to three years now. Um, it's an activation of public space for the well-being of communities, um, specifically the community, low socioeconomic community that lives in Wollstone. Um, we have started growing food in there. Um, we have over a hundred fruit and nut trees, all of heritage varieties. Um, we've got 42, I think at last count, 42 different varieties of heritage apple. Um, so we're actually becoming a bit of an archive for these um, really important apple species um, that exist still in our country. And um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of information sort of around the process of them coming here and lots of stories that sort of connect us back to our, our um, cultural roots over in England for, for a lot of us. Um, um, we've also started landscaping in October, we started landscaping a community garden space, which is about vegetable production, but it's probably as much or more about a bumping space for community to gather and build relationships. So that feels really exciting. Um, and we're doing native regeneration in the park as well. So we do take a whole ecosystem approach to what we're doing in there. Um, and then I run several sort of related projects off the back of that. So one is based in the residential red zone in Christchurch um, around foraging. So we're establishing a foraging etiquette, a way to, I guess, a moral and ethical framework for how we um, relate to free food sources that are in public spaces. Um, I'm also involved with a group around time banking, which is a way of building relationships and um, allowing the exchange of time, wisdom and expertise within communities without the need for money. Um, and then I've also just recently during the lockdown launched another project called the Otatahi Commons Transition, which is a project which at this stage is really just a discussion space for how we as a society or as a city or as a region, a bioregion could trans transition towards a different way of being, um, largely around the value of relational activities. So rather than looking at life as a series of transactions that happen between myself and an organization or another individual, what does it look like to first form the relationship and then um, support each other on our life journey through through those sort of times. So. Um, I think we've all got a lot to offer in this world, um, more than what we probably realise ourselves and give ourselves credit for. Um, and we also need to be okay with asking for help too. And um, that's a real challenge for a lot of people in our society. So they're the sorts of things that I would like to, to see change. Um, and then I guess in, re in regards to food, another kind of, project that I'm working on is um, I worked with a group of people across New Zealand to draft the first version of an Aotearoa Food Resilience Charter. So the beginnings of a policy document that creates conversation around our relationship with food in all aspects. Um, and that's currently at a stage whereby we are looking for people who are interested in feeding into that and sharing their views on it. And we can share a Google document for people to, to leave comments and such. Um, but just in the last 24 hours, we've kind of realized that maybe this is an opportunity during this time of, of disruption where people have got more space um, that we can actually build a network of people who are interested in this, uh, you know, that ranges right across our whole country 
that enables us to actually work alongside government to create some of the changes that we need um, to see in the world. And one of the big things with that is actually healing our urban and rural divide that currently exists and sort of transitioning away from this us, us and them situation that we have between those two parts of our, of our country and seeing actually how we can um, heal and hold each other and, and value each other for the parts that we play in each other's lives. Dude, I want to, I want to come back to that point Let's have a let's have a further discussion on the divide, or you know, as you and I see it, there's no such thing. But I want to go back to, you know, you talk about we often don't give ourselves credit for the opportunities that that you know our lives can be, and you've you've gone out and made the most of the opportunity that your life is, and I can see that. And we've only known each other for a short time, but was there ever a time where you doubted that? And prior to that, what was it that brought you into this space what was there a moment in your life where this became you know right this is my life yeah well i think um like a lot of people but i guess i can i can share mostly about my own journey on this but i've spent the majority of my life um sitting with a lot of self-doubt or a, a lack of um seeing my self-worth um and i feel like a lot of that is it's probably related to a, a lack of being able to see purpose and why we're here. Um, a lot of us kind of fall into the trap of doing what we need to do in order to exist in this world. Um, and existing is not enough. Um, we need, as humans, we need a lot more than that. Um, we need a lot of meaning in our lives. And so um, I started to find that at the time, sort of post earthquake. So I was actually living in the central city of Christchurch at the time of the earthquakes, like inside the army cordon zone area, which was quite an interesting experience. But I think the thing for me was that rather than getting kind of sad and depressed or upset about what had happened, and, but I fully acknowledge that it was obviously a really tough time and still is a, lot, a really tough time for a lot of people in Christchurch and, and, around, and around the world probably as well. Um, but there was an incredible opportunity that disruption creates. And I lost my job um, and actually started running a project called A Brave New City, which we somehow managed to fund out of our own money, my ex-wife and I. And basically it was a public engagement project that allowed people to talk about the values and the principles I guess the more emotive side of what they wanted to see created in Christchurch post earthquake, rather than talking about the nuts and bolts and the bricks and mortar, you know, what are the, the functional bits that we need to replace? Um, I wasn't as interested in that. I was more interested in, you know, what are the bits that create meaning in our lives as humans that are living in this place together? What is the human experience of living in a place like Christchurch? So, yeah, it all sort of came from that. And I guess one of the things that a lot of people shared during that time with me was that they wanted green spaces in their city and they wanted places to grow food. Um, and that's, I guess, what invited me to join alongside some other people talking about food resilience. Um, but probably more so, it's what um, instigated the creation of Roimata Food Commons. So... I've now fully like 100% committed to this work, um, which is a huge risk, like financially for me and probably actually emotionally and psychologically as well. Um, everything that I do relies on funding um, and finding external sources of income. Um, I am not as interested in the social enterprise aspect of um, some of the change stuff that people are talking about in the world purely because through my eyes, I see it as a way of trying to fit purposeful work into a capitalist system, rather than actually working to change the system or move towards a different system itself. So I think we're kind of in some ways perpetuating um, a system that's broken by going down that road. So I'm really interested in seeing 
and being part of creating what's next. Cool, man. And, you know, a big thing from that is, um, you know, what I'm hearing and you're sharing and you're talking about your experience so far is that you no longer view um, life as, as something that's it's, it's not all about you anymore. And I think when people realize that, you know, in order for us to all, you know, be successful and thrive, you know, we are social beings and we were, you know, bred to be connected with others. And um, once you step out of that, it's all about me world and step into, um, you know, a, a you and me world, you know, that, that being all those around you, um, you know, it starts to create an interesting space and, and, you know, capitalism is what everyone knows. And, and in that it's all about me, me, me. But do you think, you know, is there a possibility that there can be a trade off where, um, you know, people can just simply shift rather than changing the whole system. And I know that's, that's possible as well, but little integrations of sort of more communal activities, like what you suggested came from the earthquake except that was forced upon, all of a sudden there, there became to be this togetherness and, and, you know, a lot came from that. It sounds like it almost sparked everything for you. And so what are your thoughts on, um, yeah, all of a sudden, possibly with this new event that we're dealing with, the COVID-19, is there a possibility that we could bring together people, do you think, to, um, you know, be more communal and, and work together more? Absolutely, it has to happen. I mean, none of this stuff changes overnight. Um, there's always a transition. Um, and that involves several waves. We need leaders to kind of step up and, and talk and share and make this stuff relatable. Um, it's really easy to get trapped in a really academic and kind of systems thinking sort of approach to all of this stuff, which is fine for people who are academics and, and system thinkers, but um, yeah, not everyone sort of operates at that level and mm. that's absolutely fine. We don't, we can't all operate at that level. Um, we all have different gifts to offer into the world. So yeah, for sure, there has to be a gentle transition from where we have been operating at for a long, long time in the world to a different way of being. Um, yeah, and disruption actually creates the space and time for people to, I guess, delve into what it is that is meaningful in their lives. Mm. I... So absolutely, this time is absolutely crucial and critical. I mean, I'm not saying that to put pressure on people to feel like they need to be all of a sudden doing things a lot differently, but at least one of the biggest things that could come from this time right now is reflection. And it's something that I think as humanity, we don't do enough of. We act and we keep acting and we don't necessarily take the time to sit back and actually evaluate and reflect as to whether or not how we have acted in any particular part of our lives was the most optimal, not, optimal, not only for ourselves, but for the interrelated web of life that lives, lives around us. I mean, we are not separate from anything. We do not exist in separation from anything else in this world. Even if we choose to not participate in social systems with other human beings, our mm. impact on the world still exists in the wider ecosystem um, that we live within. So separation is not an option. Um, but it's taking responsibility for our actions within those spaces and making sure that we are trying to make the best choices for everything that lives on this planet and not just ourselves. Dude, what I heard there is, and I just had this thought come to my mind, is you're dead right. You know, the, in, 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 nat in natural ecosystems, everything is interconnected. You know, everything is in perfect harmony with everything else. And when you mentioned we are not separate, that what came to me then is you're, you're dead right no we are not separate but not only are we not separate the we you're referring to being us as a species the human being sadly within the human being we've got more separation so mm -hmm. like when you're referring to the to the absurdity of the separation of we as human being to the ecosystem 
you know, imagine if we could just get to that point where there is a we, where we are all together, you know, like in order to become part of the ecosystem, we have to realize that, you know, we are all together as a species, but also we are much, you know, much more part of a wider, more interconnected relationship to nature than we've ever thought um, or even considered. But also, when you look at the way things have been and the dead horse theory keeps coming to mind, you know, the, 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 the ancient proverb of, you know, when one realizes that you're riding a dead horse, the best, the best form of action is to dismount. Um, rather than, than dismount, we seem to, you know, employ great teams of people to look at how do we increase the speed of the dead horse? Do we, you know, use a bigger whip? Do we get a lighter rider? But anyway, what came to mind then was in the ecosystem of life that is a great circle and, and, and a great um, web of interconnectedness, like you say, there is no, there is no taking without giving. There is no such thing. And there's no significance. Everyone works together. And I've used this before in a presentation and I'll use it again now is it's like, imagine if, imagine if microbe A woke up in the morning and said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give up this, this, um, I'm not going to mobilize this mineral for, for this plant today. I'm just going to keep it all for myself. You know, or, or I'm not going to, I don't feel like, I don't feel like, um, you know, consuming carbon and, 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 and um, providing some minerals to, to this, this fungal network, you know, in, in nature, there is no significance and there's no self. And I'm okay with self because there's, there's amazing stuff within people's identities and I love seeing it expressed. But the main thing is you must be expressive of that, of who you are that you've created. And you must look out for, you know, it's not just yourself. You have to be part of the ecosystem and give. And actually the, the main way to, I guess, transition from that place of um, living in separation or at least feeling separate from everything else is actually celebrating diversity. Yeah, um, that's, that's what I mean. Like imagine a world of just, imagine just, just Michael Reynolds's. <laughs> oh hell. <laughs> or, just, or just John O'Frews, imagine it. <laughs> Beautiful man. <laughs> no, nothing would get done. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, diversity exists in all levels of, of life and our existence and our acknowledgement of the world around us. You know, we've had, obviously, disruptions of different kinds in Christchurch over the last few years, you know, and in relation to, I guess, the, the things that happened around the mosque shootings, you know, that was very much a separation-based um, event. And, you know, for a period of time, and it's probably existing a little bit still now, but, you know, what we tend to notice with, the, with these things is that the changes are, it's very hard to anchor them and ground them so that we actually see that sort of, that systemic level change. Um, you know, we're, we're hearing reports and incidents of racism, extreme racism even, that are happening now in Christchurch again after the happenings of the mosque shootings. So to me, that's a, that's a way that the world is showing us that although there has been a, a, a slight shift in sort of the fundamental way that we see each other, there's, there's still work to be done. And, you know, I see the same thing within, I guess, our natural systems um, and our food production is that we are starting to see those leaders step up and make those changes there's a lag. So it's a way of, I guess, supporting those leaders, those people who are willing to step up and actually um, commit to that level of change and risk in their life and hold them to be able to, I guess, let them do that and then follow in behind them closely as we can, you know, within, within our own circumstances. Um, you know, we can't all be leaders. Um, we can't all be followers and we've got to be careful how we lead too because if you're if you put your blinkers on within a leadership context 
you can quite often end up, you know, 10 kilometers off in the distance and, and, and you've disappeared from view from, from anyone that was wishing to follow you as well. And you lose impact and you leave, lose the ability to invite people to come along this journey with you. Mm. So there's a, I think there's a really specific type of leadership that we're needing right now in this world. Mm. Um, and it's all based around inclusivity. You know, how do we lead but include people in that leadership? And that experience of change in the world as it's happening, not after it's happened, and not doing it so fast and in separation from each other that we don't even witness the world never witnesses what that change even is. Yeah, yeah. And probably what's missing too, Michael, is um, you know, things happen in moments like now where people are, you know, like it's a disturbance, whether it be grief, what have you, and people often see like an obvious way out like you know we spoke earlier um about the the rapid rate of um you know people going and buying seedlings and seeds and things because they see that as a as an obvious step to take at this time and then we also joked about you know when things go back to society uh, to, to to the norm that you know whether people will continue that and so what's missing is and it, and, it, and it comes from our leadership is there must be you mentioned there must be um, a related a rel relativity. So you must people must be able to relate to the leadership. There must be acceptance and and compassion at like the highest mm -hmm. level, but also there must be some understanding. So like for people, and I and I I do this with farmers. It's like gone are the days for me for people of telling people what to do. It doesn't work. So the top down thing, that form of leadership to me doesn't work because it leaves people. Mm -hmm. Uh, uncreative it leaves people um, avoiding responsibility because they get to enjoy being told what to do and they don't understand so that when things don't work the way that they're meant to they then don't know how to go about getting around whatever the hurdle may be so what's important is that with the leadership that we're speaking of that I'm sure we're both aligned with is that there needs to be Relativeness, there needs to be the man down on the ground doing the stuff with the people. And there needs to be a level of understanding. And I talk about this with farmers and other enterprises where people must be actively engaged in the future that you're creating as a society, as a group, as a business, what have you, so that for the people amongst the group, it seems that they understand what's going on, they're part of the movement, so they, they're not going to lag, they're not going to stay behind, nor are they going to drop the ball when it comes to points of hitting, you know, challenges and, and, and speed bumps along the way. They're going to be actively aligned in the trajectory of that wider group or, or society such that, you know, they will do everything that it takes to make sure that that future that's created is fulfilled or at least, you know, head towards that direction. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of, in listening to that, it makes me think of, of one of the most important roles within our, our, our systems or the way that we used to live um, were our storytellers. So our storytellers um, that all cultures have had woven into their um, fabric of being, you know, throughout time are the keepers of wisdom and they keep and they share. Um, you know, and meal times in particular were a really amazing time for people to sit and and listen and absorb um, the stories and the wisdom that you know their people have built up over hundreds, if not thousands, of years of relating not only to each other within that human context, but in relation to the land and the water and the sky and the forests and and all of the system, you know, the eco wider ecosystem that we live within. Um, I think that's the leadership that we need. Mm. You know, we need story, people to lead and tell the stories to reconnect us with our roots of who we are as humans living on this planet. Um, to really just inspire and fill us with love and care um, to jump us forward. Yeah. Yeah, and, and also the 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 stories of which that are told, not only the storytelling, but you know, perhaps a shift away from the stories of how to make it in the in the world of business to, you know, how do we thrive as a society 
with 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 health with prosperity with resilience with connection with love you know like when i when i was coming up through the ranks in in the new zealand farming uh, industry it was all about getting to the top it was all about having the farm the owning the farm the having the boat the the you know the dog the kids the all the stuff and um i thought that was what life was and and really like and i i, I quite often go back to this is if you go out to you know go out to a nice quiet spot at two or three in the morning and look up at the sky and and ask the stars do they care for that kind of status you know really they don't so our view of what life is and what we think success is mm. you know i'm looking forward to that dialogue shifting so that the stories aren't no longer what are the kardashians doing but more like how do we how do we operate as part of the natural ecosystem and how do we bring you know the love back into the picture mm. yeah redefining success is, is a huge part of it um, and I think the other thing that's kind of coming up for me during this conversation as well is that we need to acknowledge that reciprocity is actually the default setting for nature and I mean that does kind of I guess speak to that love and care and interrelatedness um, the giving and receiving, um, you know, I think quite often what we notice in society is that we fall more so on one side or the other of, of that spectrum. You know, oh my goodness, man. Yeah. Before you carry on, Michael, for those that didn't much. go to school, for those that didn't go to school for very long, what was that word you used? Which word? The reciprocity. What is that word? So it's um, so rela healthy relationships are reciprocal. So I give what I can give, and you give what you can give, and I receive all of who you are, and vice versa. And that's just naturally accepted, and that's enough. That's more than enough. And I celebrate all that that is, and that's what we need to hold at the heart of all the relationships we have, whether it be with other humans or with our, uh, the world that lives around us. I mean, we are enough. Um, self-worth drives all of this fear-based stuff or lack of mm. self-worth drives all of this fear-based stuff. Um, if we can acknowledge and celebrate who we are as people, that is gonna go a huge way to being able to acknowledge and see each other for who we are and accept that we are enough for each other. Mm. Just and the way you to are. To me, that world is beautiful. Would there be war in that world, Michael? <laughs> no. Would there be greed in that world? No, there wouldn't. I mean, just, it's not even on the spectrum. It, it's just, it's just life. It, it's what life is. It's, yeah, we're, we're just not there. Mm. Mm. And that's the sort of leadership that we need so badly right now, Michael. Yeah, and we need to be brave and open enough to be able to talk about this stuff. I mean, it, it's not easy. Um, you know, it's easier with some people than others. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you need, in this world, you really need to be a strong person to be able to stand up and, and talk about these things in a really open and genuine and authentic way. Yeah. Um, you know, this stuff comes from the heart. It doesn't come from the mind. It's not something that you think through. It's something that you feel. Mm. Um, it's the essence of who we are as, as human beings and who I am as a human being. And I'm, I hold that as close as I can in everything that I do. Yeah. And it's beyond strength too, isn't it? Like it's, it's courage. It's, it's vulnerability. It's, you know, getting flat that expressing the way you feel. And the big one is like, you know, a bit of fear at the moment sure just let that be but another big one that's missing is imagine if we could all you know express the love and adoration that we have for others you know what would that do for some people like just not only for them getting for themselves that they are enough but then to have others come to them and say look you are as you are enough and i love you 
Mm. Some people go to their graves without telling their parents they love them. Mm. I mean, it's transformational, really, mm. the opportunity that sits there um, with this stuff. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> And I think, you know, even when we look at it on a bigger scale than, you know, individuals or, or whanau or communities, you know, I think that it can easily be invited, you know, between different parts of our society as well. So when I think about, you know, our urban and rural communities, um, there's a real need to celebrate the role that each of, each of those communities play um, and acknowledge what each of those communities bring um, into that relationship that that exists between those communities. Mm. Um, Do you know who I'm just thinking of now? Gandhi. Mm. You know, he he didn't take no, and he had people completely understanding where he was heading, and he had people, you know, that sort of leadership where you can be so vulnerable and so open and so committed to the future, the, the people, and, and why I thought of Gandhi was because he had thousands of people coming and just saying, what is it that I need to do? You know, what he, what he created was so, you know, profound and so obvious and so, you know, that people came along like just, we're, we're here, we, we, what do we need to do, you know? Imagine if we could have that as, as the leadership. Yeah, I think we can all be that though. We don't, we can't just look to one person. Um, we can all be Gandhi in our own lives. We really can. Yeah. Just your family. Yeah. And I mean, if, you know, it's, it's widely talked about in this kind of climate change um, atmosphere that we have in the world where I guess, you know, in order to create change, we all need to make individual decisions and, and create actions off the back of them. And, you know, all of those individual actions will add up to large scale change kind of across the whole, whole of the world. And I completely agree with that. You know, that is a form of leadership in itself. Mm. You know, so what taking do you think... responsibility. Oh, dude, that's a big one. Responsibility. Why do you think we're so scared of that? Um, because we live in a um, we live in a society of blame. Ah, uh, yeah. And blame is a way of absolving ourselves of responsibility. Mm. So when you know when urban communities look at farmers and talk about nitrate leaching and methane and CO two, you know, climate change related um, global warming and you know the role that farming is portrayed to play in that and you know that's an absolving of my responsibility as someone who lives in an urban community to say, well, you know, there's a bigger impact happening somewhere else. And so that's not my responsibility. They need to change what they're doing in order to um, solve this climate change um, related issue that we're having in the world today. Mm. Um, but we're actually all in this together, mm. you know? So um, blaming anyone part of society or any one person or any one group um, never shifts us along the journey of healing. It just keeps us in that same place and the blame just goes backwards and forwards. Mm, mm. And so it actually immobilizes or disempowers us as people who are wanting to affect change. Um, we just end up in this cycle of inaction um, and really taking responsibility and seeing our own roles within this and actually supporting each other to make the changes that we need to make. Um, that's, that's the invitation that sits there in front of us, yeah. um, blaming each other. And once you step beyond that, because I've been in that position before where I've had the finger pointed and all the stuff, you know, once you, you know, get purposeful about what your life is and what it's going to be and step beyond that fear of having blame put upon you and realizing that the people blaming and pointing the finger are doing so for them to avoid responsibility and that it is all over there with them and that it has nothing to do with you, absolutely nothing. 
you know, show me blame. Like really, you know, what is blame? And so once we step beyond that and get purposeful about our lives and get into action, is that, you know, sure, and my experience was that people will continue for a short period of time, but once they realize that, and, and really listening to the people that are blaming, like really, really listen powerfully to what it is that, that their occurring is of the situation and, and understanding that their actions are perfectly correlated to their occurring of the situation and just hearing them and just really getting them. And then all of a sudden, what my experience was, and this was particularly cool going through, you know, a separation, my marriage when it was ending, was really hearing her mm. side of the story. And for others, when I started changing my farming practices, really understanding and listening. And then all of a sudden, you know, there was no blame. When I, when mm. I took responsibility for making sure that I was going to do what I was going to do, regardless of what other people thought, all of a sudden, you know, people were, were able to understand that actually blame is really ineffective. And that all it is is a tool for that those people to avoid responsibility. How do we actually encourage anyone to take risk when Dude. there's that clear cloud of um, blame hanging over us? I mean, yeah. there's no incentive to step into those leadership roles and do things differently if there's this knowingness or at least a fear of being blamed if it doesn't work or if it doesn't work mm. the way that we thought it would or, or whatever it is. Um, yeah, I think it's a huge disincentive um, for change. It's like this, for man. Sure. This, this is what it's like for me is I'm, so I, I go and do my thing. You know, I, I do a lot of stuff. And the whole time, I'm not righteous about what I'm doing like you must do what I'm doing. I'm just out there doing mm. what I'm doing. And people can choose whether they want to listen and people can disagree all they like. It doesn't bother me because I'm not attached to proving anyone wrong. So when you can get out of the space of right and wrong and just dealing with the is of the situation, minus any attachment of being right, is when I'm out there on the skinny branches, and I use this term often, and you can understand and relate because you're out there on the skinny branches too, is that yes, it's scary. And yes, you can have Every day, there's an opportunity that people can just, you know, tear you down, like for sure. And once you realize that, um, you know, you, you step out, your neck's on the line, your butt's on the line. But at the same time, if things happen, it's okay. Mm. And I'm not going to get upset when things don't go the way that I'd foreseen them to be. And I'm not going to stop. And so if something happens and I, and I come across a hurdle or two, um, you know, the trend, that's where vulnerability comes in. It's like, okay, I, um, I didn't get that one quite right. And um, yeah, I, I, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't see that coming and I'm okay with it and I'm going to keep going. Yeah. I think there's a big piece in this around expectations that we set. Um, for ourselves and for each other when we create these things mm -hmm. is that we we go into things with expected outcomes and when we don't that's an opportunity for us to judge ourselves or others mm. um, so actually release, releasing ourselves from that framework of expected outcomes um, I think is actually a huge um, step into having freedom to be able to express ourselves and take the risks that we need to take in order to you know live into the purpose of who we are as people and why we're here i mean mm. i do the work that i do because it's who i am mm. and i acknowledge that this is the purpose that i'm here for on this planet and to do anything other than this would create friction and probably negative mental health you know, outcomes for me. And I've experienced that in my life, mm. um, completely and utterly, <laughs> I've been there. Um, and I've never felt more alive and more joyful um, than in the work that I'm doing right now because I'm living into who I am as Michael Reynolds on this planet. And I am who I am. There's not another one of me. Um, so yeah, celebrate who you are as a person on this planet and, and, and be that person. And don't worry about the judgment that 
comes from that. That's someone else's baggage mm. that I don't need to hold on to. Mm. Imagine if you did. You know, like I just wouldn't do it. Yeah, but that's the thing. Like we wouldn't be going anywhere. <laughs> no, I mean I'm in a. I'm a, I'm a, like you said, we're out on the skinny branches. You know, I could be homeless within the next two or three months um, because of the work that I do. You know, there's no guaranteed income. It's all funding based. I have to, you know, keep proving myself um, to other people in order to be able to get what I need in order to operate in this world and put a roof over my head and my children's head. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's uncomfortable um, at times. Um, there are lots of times then when that doesn't even occur to me at all because I'm so deep into what I'm doing that it, it just doesn't matter. Um, and and if, if we if we get attached to comfort, you know, we're not innovating. We're not trying new things. We had this discussion before earlier today, Michael, you and I, about yes, it's exciting. Yes, it's fulfilling, you know, and it's scary. And that's okay. Yeah, well, I mean, I like this week. I paid rent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it really is part of the discovery process of of finding out who you are. You know, if you stay in certain zones in your life, then you're not testing your boundaries. You're not finding out, you know, what the potential of what you could create or what you could hold or who you could be or how you could feel in this world. Um, yeah. So I think. You know, this has been a really huge process of discovery for me as an individual living in this world and in my roles that I that I have as a father and, you know, and as partners in relationships and um, friendships and of all kinds, you know, across the world. Um, I'm learning a lot more about myself and what I'm capable of and what I'm capable of feeling and connecting with. Um, through this work and that's immense you know that improves my experience of living on this planet yeah yeah and I would wish that for everyone and that takes some courage and it takes some you know massive vulnerability and and the other thing it takes man is, is action you know getting out there and getting yeah. into action you know like the world yeah. actually doesn't care for our intentions <laughs> yeah yeah there's there's a balance i think and and i think this probably relates back to that idea of reciprocity is balance there's a balance between thinking and doing um i think again as human beings we can quite easily get trapped on one side or the other of that fence a little more than than is helpful um you know there's that often that that term um, less hooey more dewy that kind of gets floated around a lot because we quite often sit around and talk a lot about you know the change that we want to see in the world and, and there's, there's a value in that for sure but it then needs to be channeled into something that people can interrelate with can connect with and, and can experience um, so there needs to be a, a doing hands-on participatory sort of part to all these things otherwise again how does it how does that knowledge or how does that inspiration um, that's gathered within that group how does that permeate out into the rest of society if if it's continually just churned around in a in a circle of thinking and yeah. um, we need to experiment maybe a little bit more and I guess that's where bravery comes in um, bravery and courage come in too is that you know we just need to to feel comfortable to be able to go out there and do something and find out if it works or not mm. and if it doesn't I mean generally with anything in the world there's two outcomes it'll work or it won't work either way you win because if it works great keep doing it if it doesn't work cool you know that that doesn't work now and you can change it yeah. to be something that might be an iteration of that that will work you're moving still moving along a journey of discovery and creating solutions in the world Dude, so you know yeah. we don't need to be afraid of failure failure yeah. is just learning what what okay, okay. So, the other thing michael before i go into what is failure you know does nature fail there's no, 
there's no such thing as failure. I was actually yeah. given the opportunity by a group in, in Christchurch here called Link Leadership and Communities to talk at Fail Club, um, which was a really interesting sort of thought process for me. It's like, hmm, do these people see that I've failed enough in my life in order to be an ex considered to be an expert on failure? <laughs> and what does that say about me? <laughs> it's like, yeah, I'm successful at failing. Um, but in the process of trying to figure out what I was going to say around that for that particular event was the acknowledgement that there is no such thing as failure. There's only learning, you know, and, and really we only stop learning when we stop trying. We stop participating. So, yeah. Yeah. And we stop connecting with each other and, and being, you know, part of that interconnected web of wisdom and love that exists on this planet. Do you know what, Michael? There was a time in society where we couldn't fly and that it was, it was absurd to consider that we could fly. Mm -hmm. And then these dudes, the Wright brothers, came along. And I'd imagine there was some discomfort in, in you know, when I, when I talk about action, bro, it's not, it's, you know, you mentioned no, less hooey, more dewy. Hooey is still action. Like discussion is still action um, and much like a declaration of what you're up to, like you and your introduction. And I know you as the person you are, that at some point was a declaration. So there's things that we are living into like the future, but without declaring it or getting into action as far as creating it, it is nothing. And so even writing something down is getting something in creation. Even having a discussion with something is getting it in creation. And how are you going to act to have it be that that is going to become the future that you actively live into? You know, that's the sort of action I'm talking about. And, and much like the Wright brothers, when they decided, hey, look, I think I can fly. When you're, when you're, when you're creating that, which you are going to make your life about and it's so clear and obvious to you the things required the resources the people the knowledge the discovery it all just seems to unfold do you get mm. that like i think of anyone i don't have this conversation with many people but i think you can probably understand you know somehow yeah there's a word um, collaboration that gets bandied around a lot um, in the world today and in, in, in terms of um, ways of working or doing things in relationship with others um, to create more impact or at least bring in a, a diversity of skills and knowledge, expertise, wisdom um, in order to create solutions for certain issues in the world. Um, I haven't experienced a lot of it myself. The piece that's missing for me is the relational aspect. Um, life for me is about values and living true to the value that I hold in my life and only in a, you know, when we're in these, I guess, more work related relationships, um, it's only when you achieve that values alignment and that relational sort of aspect of, of being with each other that you can actually step into that role of collaboration where two entities or two people or however many people are involved in this collaboration can actually share enough of themselves into, a, into a, a container that they all hold in order to be able to create something that's grounded and actually impactful out in the world. Um, if we can't form those relationships and hold those relationships with the people that we can work with, then um, we're very, very much limiting ourselves to the impact that we can have in the world. So I see a lot of partnerships and I see a lot of projects and stuff that happen. Um, but I feel very strongly that I don't see a lot of collaboration happening where we're actually working at that values, that heart level with each other to really create impact in the world. It's like to me right now, I'm just present to one, how on earth did we meet? You know, <laughs> isn't it crazy? <laughs> like, is it, right now us having this discussion what are the odds and and i really what like how did we meet isn't it crazy mm. <laughs> i 
um, the universe does a lot of things that we don't need to know about. No. We don't need to know why. Um, we just need to acknowledge that um, there was a reason why they happened. And once you sort of accept that, then you're open to what that could actually invite for, for ourselves and for the rest of humanity. So, wow. um, yeah. Michael, what is, for you, paint me a picture, if you will, please. And I'm sure it's vivid and I'm sure it's there for you. What, what are we going to look like in 10 years time? For you. I guess as someone who holds on to quite a strong vision or who kind of lives into a, a role of being a visionary in this world. Um, I'd love for money to play a much, much smaller role in our lives. I'd love for us to value the relationships that we hold in our lives as our way of, I guess, um, exchange in the world, you know. Um, I'd love to see us connecting with the planet in a way that is regenerative. I'd love us to be connecting with each other in a way that is regenerative, that we build each other up and we're not taking from one another in order to um, be more ourselves. Um, I, I guess I have different visions when I put different hats on. Um, but for me, I guess probably my strongest vision sits around the Romata Food Commons project. And what I want to invite into the world um, with that project in mind is a new way of communities being built around, I guess, common resources and needs that we all share and to value each other and our parts in creating what we can do to support each other. So we're using food as a vehicle to be able to have that conversation. And, you know, everyone on this planet needs food um, to varying degrees. Um, we need highly nutrient dense food as well. Um, we probably could consume less and, you know, consume more of the right things. Um, and we need it to be as close to where we live as possible. Um, ideally, we need to be doing it for ourselves and for the people that live around us. So we do it in relationship with each other. Um, and we do it in relationship with nature and acknowledging the wisdom that sits in the land and the water and the air around us. If we open our hearts and listen to what the world has to share with us, then we can step into quite a different world. Wow. I've got goosebumps, man. Me too. <laughs> and so talk me through, um, I just want to finish up with what's the next few steps for you? What's the next few movements for what you're up to? Um, and I'd also love for you to speak on, you know, what is it that you're requiring? So next steps, um, one thing that's probably come up in the last 24 hours is um, there's, a, there's a real opportunity as a, I guess, a group of people across our country who are interested in food security and food resilience um, to, I guess, work at a, a potentially a, a government level in terms of policy and action um, for the whole of Aotearoa. Um, there's an acknowledgement within that, that you know, there isn't a shortage of food in our supply chains. Um, it's not necessarily the right food and it's not necessarily, not necessarily readily available for all, everyone that lives in our country. There's accessibility and affordability issues um, around our food. So um, there are things that are incorporated within a piece of work that I've been working with um, on for a while. Actually, the first draft I created on the afternoon of the mosque shootings, it was my reaction to, to shock and hate and disruption in my life here in, in Christchurch was to create something powerful and impactful. 
And so I've sat down and wrote the first version. I've been working on it with a group of people. And so we've got the Aotearoa Food Resilience Charter that sets out, a, I guess, a decision-making framework for the whole of the country, but also it could be applied in a, a regional or even a community level as a way for people to start making decisions that are um, positively impactful around food in, in the world. So that's feeling um, quite important for me right now. Um, within Roy Mata, I'm feeling like there's an, a, there's a desire within me to expand beyond some of the activities that we're doing now. One of the big parts of conversations that we've been having is around waste minimization. So we're looking at creating a local closed loop community um, composting scheme. We've got restaurants in Christchurch and in our local neighborhood that are interested in feeding their green waste in. Um, with the intention that the compost that's created obviously feeds the soil that we have at Roymata, but also becomes a free resource for the people in our community to be able to start growing healthy kai in their own um, places. Um, and there's also a redistribution um, of food sort of idea as well, um, which I know is happening a lot across um, the world probably. Um, but I think local responses are really important um, in these times. That's where resilience is built. So um, I guess the biggest hurdle that we always come up with or come up against in these spheres is the funding, the resources for the human part of this work. It's easy to get, well, it's easier to get funding for projects, for things that people can see, you know, a table, a piece of machinery, um, some signs or whatever it is, um, but to actually resource the leaders that sit in behind the things, um, those things, you know, the machinery, the table, all those things would not be there if there wasn't the person sitting there or the group of people sitting there willing to hold space for those things to be there. So if, if there was a fundamental shift that I would like to happen alongside all of this other stuff is that I would like to see a desire to fund people who are willing to adopt those leadership roles and, and take that risk, um, support them, find ways to support them financially and otherwise, um, because we're, we're barely going to move without them. Mm -hmm. And Michael, how do people get in contact with you if they want to be involved or want to help you with what you're doing? Well, I think I have about 5 million Facebook pages. So <laughs> um, I have one for my sort of overarching work, which is I use um, Michael Reynolds Food System Change Catalyst. Um, so you can always contact me through that. And the email address that goes along with that is food system change catalyst at gmail.com. Um, after that, I, you know, if people are interested in getting in contact, then reach out and then we can have a conversation either via Zoom or over the phone so we can connect properly rather than filling the world up with more emails. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm just, I'm really interested in working with passionate people who are willing to, to really give of themselves and participate in these things um, from a place of, of, of love and care and um, kaitiakitanga or stewardship of, of the planet and the world around us. Cool, man. Cool. And for, for, before we go, Michael, before, um, for, for all the people that are sitting at home, watching, wherever they are, you know, we're experiencing some interesting times at the moment and um, we're finding ourselves isolated, which you and I know isn't uh, the nicest feeling. What would you have to say to people yeah. out there who are perhaps struggling with the isolation? Um, what would you have to say to those people? Find if, if connection is really important to who you are as a person, which I think, you know, people need different levels of connection. Um, find ways to connect if you can, even if it's talking over a fence or um, saying hello to people when you're out for a walk. Um, it doesn't need to be a long conversation, but the acknowledgement of, of people around us, um, 
just waving or saying hello can be a real lift to one's mood. Um, lean into your feelings as well, because there's wisdom in there, there's learnings in there. So when we're feeling, I guess, lonely and afraid, you know, really leaning into that, we get to learn what it is that actually we need for ourselves um, and actually celebrate it's an opportunity to celebrate parts of our own personalities and what we offer to the world as well. So, um, yeah, just really sit with your feelings and, and kind of try and uh, use reflection to figure out where those feelings are actually coming from. And then we'll understand ourselves just that little bit better so that when the opportunity to open our doors and, and come together again does come, that um, we do so as a with a deeper understanding of who we are. I like it, dude. I like it. Well, Michael, thank you so much for your time chatting with me today. And I'm sure it's of massive value to people out there. And I acknowledge you for the work you're doing, man. It takes courage, it takes balls, and you're out there doing it. And um, I can only look forward to, you know, helping you as I can and, and watching the whole thing unfold. Yeah, well, huge thanks to you too. Um, you're doing a lot. Um, you're holding a lot in this world. And I really cherish and acknowledge what you are offering of yourself um, for all of us. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's three phrases that I think that if we can start practicing using them with each other um, can go a long way to um, creating deeper relationships. So what I offer to you, Jono, is that I, I see you and I hear you, and I cherish you. Oh, bro. Thanks, man. And the same goes for you. Cool. Take care. All right, bro. All right, bro. Bye. We'll talk soon.